One of the philosophical phases that, that I went through, I would say in large part in my undergraduate years, but continuing in a somewhat different way in my, my graduate career when I became very interested in, in semiotics as a discipline was what I would call my, my logicist phase. And by that, I don't necessarily mean the same thing that, that Russell meant uh, along with Whitehead by the logicist project, but, but something along the same kind of lines. And if you're not familiar with <clears throat> that sort of idea, here's the, the basic, the basic uh, conception. It was a long-standing idea, and I'll talk a little bit about the history, but in the 20th century that if we could just get the, the logic and the foundations of mathematics and then the ways of modeling right, we could, we could conceptualize everything that, that was uh, needed to be conceptualized. We could draw new conclusions based on, you know, sort of deriving things from the theorems that we already, we already had. And we could attain um, complete certainty and predictability. Um, we, could, we could know things through and through. And that turned out to be a bust, in part because um, mathematics and logic turn out to, to include a lot more paradoxes than, than we understood. And in part, that's because reality is much more complex than this dream that, that people have always had of reducing it to a, a formal, something that can be represented by a formal system. Reality always resists being reduced to a formal system, and it does so in a number of different interesting, very interesting ways that are worth um, exploring. But there's, there's this attraction that's run through not just the history of philosophy, but let's call it the history of ideas in a larger sense. So it includes some people doing mathematics, it includes some people doing physics, it includes some people um, engaged in, in studying human communication and trying to reduce it, say, to cybernetics. Uh, it includes some people in psychology, you know. Um, it includes a whole bunch of different things. And it goes all the way back, if we had to pick one person to pin it on, it would be Pythagoras. This, this Pythagorean idea that um, everything ultimately at its basis is not just modelable by numbers or representable or, or you know, um, able to be manipulated or conceptualized by numbers, but everything actually is at its ultimate root, in some sense, numbers. And um, Plato had a somewhat different conception, but there are, there are definitely some Pythagorean elements in, in Plato, particularly in, in some of the later dialogues. Um, this isn't my idea, my own ideas, this is what you know, some of the scholars tell us. And um, Aristotle and Diogenes Laertes, at least in what they're telling us about the Platonic school, there were at least some people who thought that reality was, uh, or the, the, the you know, thing that's most real is in, is in fact in some way numbers. And Numbers are kind of a, a weird thing, you know. If you think there's a there's a whole branch of philosophy called the philosophy of, of mathematics, and it's concerned with questions like, well, what are numbers actually? You know, here's three, but is this the number three as such? No, because here's three over here as well, and you know, um, this is also six. You know, you can there's all sorts of things to explore. Are numbers forms? Are they something that only exists in our head? Are they something that that um, have to do with the way we use language. There's, there's a lot of different theories out there. Anyway, that, that's a bit of a digression. Um, why did I get into this sort of mindset that, that not only runs from tendencies in Pythagoras and, and Plato all the way through Descartes and Leibniz and then into to, you know, some uh, modern 19th, 20th, and probably 21st century um, mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, other types of scientists. Um, well, it was it was kind of a fluke. I mean, for one thing, I can I can tell you this. I am in in a certain respect always a metaphysician at heart, which means that I've always had the sense that there's more to the picture than what we see and the ways in which we're thinking about it. And I wanted to know what the basic you know, reality was. Not necessarily to pull back the, the veil from the appearances as if the appearances don't matter, because actually my, the way I look at things metaphysically, they do in fact matter quite a bit. They have their own type of, of reality. 
Um, but there was always this sense that there was something more, and that there was something not only more, but you know, in the sense of some unintelligible surd, something that would just be there and, and we wouldn't know much about it, but something that would be intelligible, something that was tailored to, to the human capacity, once properly trained, to, to, to know, to follow out our desire for, for knowledge. So, I went into the study of philosophy with that in, in mind, and as an undergraduate, I've, I've mentioned this in a few other videos, I not only majored in philosophy, I majored in mathematics, and it was kind of a fluke that, that threw me into that. I didn't think I was very interested in mathematics uh, at first, and as a matter of fact, in high school, I was, I was a little bit ahead, and so I got placed, you know, a grade ahead, so I did geometry as a freshman, and then algebra, two trigonometry as a, uh, a sophomore, and I think actually I didn't do any mathematics after that in, in high school. I just didn't feel like messing around with it. I'd, I'd satisfied my requirements. Um, I got placed in a calculus class my first semester freshman year, and the guy who taught it, Ron Haas, he began by teaching us the theory of limits. And this was mathematics in a way that I had never seen before. It wasn't just numbers. It was explaining what was going on with what we're doing with the numbers. The reality that we're trying to model or come to understand. Um, because limits themselves are involving numbers, but they're, they're not a number. As a matter of fact, a, a limit is, in a certain sense, a, a lack of number, if you want to think about it that way. A lack of fixity. They're, they're being progressively, infinitesimally smaller and smaller amounts until you reach some number that, you know, is supposed to be the limit, but the limit isn't really that. Um, anyway, this got me thinking. And, you know, I'd been in geometry before, so I, I was used to the notion of proofs, but they were very boring in high school, just really dull stuff, you know, and we just had to memorize them, and we didn't actually do our own proofs. And, I, you know, I understood the idea of computation and all that sort of stuff, but this was something very new. And then, of course, when, it, you know, we got introduced to the notion of functions and functions of functions and the way they worked, you know, things were taken to a, a higher level of abstraction, and many of the other students didn't like that, but I, I found it very engaging. Back at that time, I had a, a much greater capacity for uh, abstract thinking than I, I think I do now. Um, I also had the sense of what we call mathematical intuition, which is very important if you're going to progress in, in, in higher level mathematics, um, which I, I don't necessarily think I have now. I don't push myself when it comes to that. So anyway, I, I liked that so much, I took Calculus 2, and then I took Calc 3, and then I said, well, hey, I may as well become a math major. And I just kept taking math class after math class after math class. And at the same time in philosophy, you know, I took Intro, and then the next semester after that I took Ethics and Logic, and then I began taking the Historical Sequence. And Logic I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, it, this is sort of, again, a function of where I went to, to school. There was this sense that, well, the history of philosophy is just kind of a bunch of problems and people have said different things about it here and there, but nobody really has arrived at any sort of satisfactory conclusion. So you just kind of figure it out as you go along and pick and choose what you like. And it was that way in just about everything except for logic. With logic, there, were, there was a progressive building. We used Copy's uh, logic textbook, which is a pretty standard one. And you can cover more and more and more and more and build in a kind of, not necessarily scaffolding way, but almost a cyclotic way, higher and higher, till you can address more and more stuff. That fascinated me. And we were fortunate enough to have, for one reason or another, quite a, quite a few works on logic and the foundations of mathematics and things like that in our library. So I, I read through those and I saw how you could, you know, apply modeling over here and, you know, maybe there could be a logic of, you know, um, time or there's, there's a logical structure to moral life or, you know, modality, you know. 
uh, all these sorts of things that people were doing that were quite interesting with logic. Um, pretty much everything that I was studying was uh, what we call modern logic, you know, uh, late 19th and, and early 20th century, all the way to the, the you know, 70s and 80s kind of stuff. And I thought that was uh, quite, quite, you know, interesting. And, and um, I think, you know, when it came down to it, for me it was, it was uh, you know, we make a distinction in philosophy between the theoretical and speculative. You know, where somebody wants to know something for the sake of knowing that thing, not necessarily because there's any application. And then the practical, where we're concerned with what it is that we can do or what we ought to do or how things, how things actually do in fact happen so we can manipulate them or change them or, or make them go, go a certain way. Um, and I was very much interested in these things from a speculative point of view, not from a, a practical point of view, which was a nice luxury back then. And I think part of what attracted me so much to mathematics and to logic and to thinking that you could extend this into everything was uh, two, two qualities that, that mathematicians strive for. One is rigor. One is being able to, you know, rigorously lay out what it is that's supposed to be going on and, you know, show somebody step by step by step. If they understand the concepts, they ought to be able to, to, to understand the conclusions that you're arguing for or arriving at. Um, and then there's elegance. This is a little bit harder to put your, your finger on and define, but there's, there's a kind of elegance to mathematics and to logic that is very attractive. Um, there was also this promise that, that by going further and further and further into this sort of thing and by, by um, accepting the postulate that these could be extended in theory to, to just about every type of reality, that these would make reality fully intelligible, and that was that was probably I would say my, my greatest desire at the, the time. Um, still is a, a desire. I just have a different way of approaching it now. And so I you know like I said I majored in mathematics and I took you know various classes. I, I went through calculus uh, as far as the sequence went and. Uh, then we got into, you know, I don't remember the exact sequence of what we did, but we did linear algebra, which is very nice because you work with these matrices and you can use them to model things. It's very useful for logistics problems. Um, also good for game theory. And uh, linear algebra I was really interested in, and uh, well, I talked number theory in particular I was, I was uh, very interested in because that showed me that even if you changed the system that you were working with, you could, you could in theory model mathematics upon mathematics. Um, that's probably not the best way to, to talk about it, but that, that was the basic insight, that you can map these things onto each other. Um, I also found particularly interesting um, some of the other things like, like uh, probability and statistics. Uh, I was less interested in, you know, compiling statistics for its own sake and more interested in the theory of probability, what was actually going on with that. And I started looking at, wow, these assumptions that we have to make in order to make this, this sort of stuff work. And I was particularly interested in this, this field that we call the foundation of mathematics, which is really working with, with logic. And uh, mathematics is based on, on logic. And um, so, you know, if you can understand that stuff, then you can, you can understand what it is that we're really doing with mathematics. Um, so I, I, was in, I was very deeply into that, and I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit, before I tell you about how I got out of it, I'll tell you, and actually I'm going to show you, I've got some props. Um, here's, here's a sort of typical representative work, uh, uh, Luce, Luce and Raffia's Games and Decisions, um, very old, you know, game theory textbook. I loved this stuff because, you know, it's 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 uh, working out, you know, bit by bit by bit the theory of, of games of strategic decision making, uh, meaning decision making that you have to engage in when the other person over there is also engaging in similar stuff. And how do you model what's going on in their head and how it affects what's going on in your head? Just you know, very interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> I ended up writing my, my senior thesis on truth self-referential statement groups. 
and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that it still must be at Lakeland College somewhere um, in the library. Uh, I, I don't have a copy of it. I, I don't know what, it, what you know. That's several computers ago, so I don't, I don't have any idea what's become of it. Um, I'm not even sure what I wrote it in originally. And I got interested in this question of the liar's paradox. You know, the liar's paradox is very simple. There's a couple different variations on it. There's, you know, uh, Epimedes the Cretan says all Cretans are liars. So, you know, if he's lying, that means that he's telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, that means that he's lying. You've got this back and forth sort of thing. And I got interested in larger sort of networks where you might have a couple people talking about who's telling the truth and who's lying. Um, and there could be there could be some cases where what they were saying was actually self-referential and then there could be some cases where it was just referential to you know the other guy and then the other guy refers to them and I thought well how can I model this and so I came up with a functional uh, way of modeling it um, and I showed that all truth self-referential statement groups if all we were dealing with was truth self-referentiality boil down to the liar's paradox or to something that's sort of like a tautology, you know, this, this loop where it's something, everything is true or everything is, is, is uh, false. And um, that was kind of interesting. I excluded a lot of pragmatic considerations like the degree of probability that you would ascribe to somebody or if it was in terms of other modalities like um, you know, a person being good or bad, or reliable or unreliable. Um, and, and I did that in order to make it a simpler process. Um, but, you know, in, in theory it could be extended out to, to other things. Well, like, it's very complicated very quickly once we start dealing with, with these sort of you know, logics that, that are not just of, of truth and falsity. Um, so I, I did that, and I, you know, that was, that was my senior project. And then when it came time to write a uh, application paper for graduate school, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done, and I'm I'm just so surprised that I got accepted at, at quite a few places. Um, what I actually did was I said, well, you know, and I'd been thinking about this for a while. I realized that a geometrical modeling of this um, this thing for the liars paradox that a lot of truth self-referential statement groups boil down to was actually the the Mubius band. And I'd done a lot of the playing around with them and, you know, pasting strips of paper together and doing twists and, and things along those lines. In case you don't know, what a, what a Mubius strip is, is a, it's a ring of paper or anything else that you like, and you give it one half twist. So it's actually only got one side to the entire thing. And what this means is that graphically, or, or you know, topographically, uh, the liar's paradox is is uh, equivalent to a one-sided figure, where what appears locally to be uh, truth is on the other side locally falsity, but where it's all really the same thing. And so that's what I submitted a three-page discussion of that. By then, I was really getting out of that, and um, let me talk about why. I, I ended up leaving this, this sort of dream of the Logisys project behind. And again, I have, I have a bunch of props, a bunch of books that sort of fit in with this. Two of these really have to do with um, uh, mathematics and philosophy per se. And one of them that I came across was Wittgenstein's remarks on the foundations of mathematics. And I'd, I'd read some Wittgenstein as an undergraduate, and I thought this stuff was very interesting. And when I got to this, um, this is the nice one. It's got the German on one side and the English on the other. This, I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that he actually talked about this. And Wittgenstein was very interested in trying to figure out, well, what is it that we're doing when we're doing mathematics? And he thought of it in terms of, of language and how we actually use language to understand the world. He didn't begin from mathematics and then say, well, language is going to be, you know, mathematizable or model, you know, able to be modeled through mathematics, he's actually going the other way around. He's doing a radical shift and saying, no, language is actually broader and mathematics and what can be dealt with in terms of mathematics is actually 
just a portion of, of our world and of our, our language and our, our existence as communicative beings. So that was, that was something that, you know, really gave me pause. Um, another thing, another book that, that actually we did a math class, it was a, se a special seminar just on this. We went through the entire work. Um, this is a big book in the, the 1980s and 90s, uh, Gerda Lescher Bach, and wonderful, wonderful book. What it's dealing with, the entire book, is trying to think about artificial intelligence on the one hand, and also trying to think about um, Kurt Gerdell's incompleteness theorem. And to be very simple about it, Kurt Gerdell's incompleteness theorem says that when it comes to any formal system, and mathematics itself is a formal system, logic is a formal system, anything that you can, you can do with them is a formal system, um, you can have it one or two ways, but you can't have it both. Either you can have a very strong system, a very rigorous system, but then there's going to be a lot of things that, that end up getting left out. Or you can try to make it as complete as possible, but then you're going to have inconsistencies. You're actually going to have some contradictions arising within it. And you got to pick one or the other because you can't, you can't actually have it both ways. Um, you can't have both of the things that you want to have, which is complete, you know, complete rigor and complete applicability or extensibility, however you want to think about it. Um, and I'm, I'm you know, paraphrasing very roughly here. I understand this is not the exact language of Grudel's incompleteness theorem. You can supply that yourself. That, that's quite all right. And in any case, um, what this led me to realize was that there were these paradoxes deep within the heart of mathematics and logic that you would never be able to, to, to get rid of, that you would never actually end up um, overcoming and that that was integral to the very nature of the way mathematics interfaced with, with reality. That was in the heart of, of mathematics. And I began to understand, and this, this, this book, again, is very good for pointing this out, that part of what constitutes intelligence is actually being able to get past what it is that formal systems allow us or make possible. Now, another thing that uh, helped sort of break me out of my logicist phase was um, existentialism, in particular Sartre. I was very big on Sartre, and this is his, you know, master early work, Being and Nothingness. Of course, this isn't the one that I had at the time. I had the bigger volume with, uh, you know, the guy depicted on the front, um, but this is what I have nowadays. And with existentialism, at least Sartrean existentialism, there were, there were a couple things that were reacting against this logicist idea. One was that, this, this, this view that, um, look, what's really most important tends to be individual, tends to be existential, tends to be stuff that we've lived. It's not stuff that's susceptible to being put into a universal framework or language. Uh, it resists that. And when we try to push it into that, it deforms it and we lose it in the process. Um, another thing that was really, you know, important for, again, for breaking me out of this was the realization that, let's say we live in a deterministic universe, we would still have free will, according to Sartre. And I was a, a hardcore Sartrean for a while. I mean, you can look at my, my video about my Sartrean phase. One of the things that I really liked the most about Sartre was his emphasis on our radical freedom. Even if we're in a situation that is completely deterministic, we still choose what attitude that we're going to take or what we're going to adopt uh, towards our what he calls our facticity. So the other thing that I would say help me work my way out of this, this logicist phase and into what I think are more productive ways, philosophical ways of doing things, happened to be a short story writer and poet um, who had a deep interest in metaphysics, in language, and in um, mathematics. And that is Jorge Luis Borges. This is the, the, book, the first book of his that I, I bought, Labyrinths. And you know, this is a great volume because it, it has um, 
has some of his, his best stories in there, and it's got a lot of essays too, which are interesting, like, uh, of course, The Garden of Forking Paths. My favorite one is actually The Lottery at Babylon, and maybe I'll do a video sometime about why I like that better than almost any of the other ones. But, you know, The Circular Ruins, another one of my big favorites. The Library of Babel, a lot of people, you know, are very interested in, in that one because, you know, um, Borges says, I imagine that paradise would be like a library. Um, Three Versions of Judas, that's a really interesting one. The Story of the Warrior and the Captive, The House of Asterion, uh, it's just full of great stuff. What Borges was really interested in, in doing was thinking in terms, he's very Leibnizian, thinking in terms of a universal language that could in fact express everything and allow us to connect everything up together in, in intelligibility. And his stories are, are explorations of how the very nature of reality and language undoes that, generally through making things even more complex and complicated. You could think of what Borges is doing in, um, in literature as prefiguring mathematical chaos theory. Not the, you know, depiction of chaos theory, say, in, in Jurassic Park or, you know, popularizations, but, but this notion, also, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a great book out there called The Mathematics of Meaning that ties Borges to uh, catastrophe theory. And what he's pointing out are, again, these, these is very similar to what's going on with, with um, Gerdel Asher Bach and also, you know, Wittgenstein, that there are paradoxes inherent to the very nature of the interface between mathematics and reality. And we are that interface too, by the way. Um, the human person, the human being, endowed with will, reason, intellect, developable, fallible. Um, we are where that, that takes place, human being. Um, so all of these things pushed me out of this, this this notion which would say we can take mathematics and make reality and make human being fit into the structures of mathematics and logic in a, a way that would resolve everything, that would make everything intelligible. That turns out to be an impossible dream. That's not to say that mathematics is not of uh, just amazing um, extension and usefulness and, and beauty in many respects. Um, it just doesn't do what, what some of the dreams that people have had, like Descartes or at one time Bertrand Russell, had of them, or, or myself. So um, that's, that's another little chapter in my, my philosophical development. Maybe you found it interesting, maybe it uh, uh, doesn't really have much to do with what you're doing in, in your uh, philosophical studies, but there it is.